Szene noch einmal in diesem
Why the car get it? So I can read the song. Okay. Oh, Jesus. Some standing here who will not taste death 
before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Here ends the gospel. Praise be to you, Christ. The congregation of the Spirit. Thirty-seven years ago, in June of 1977, I attended a, a worldwide assembly of the, of the Lutheran churches in Dar es Salaam in, in Tanzania. And uh, the reason I give such a precise date is because I have such strong memories of that occasion. Tanzania is a beautiful part of the world with verdant foliage, white sand beaches. You go to the beach in Tanzania in the summertime, it's almost like you're walking in white sugar out there on the beach. And the ocean water is so warm, it's like stepping into a bath. The official language of the country, of the country of Tanzania, is Swahili. And Swahili is a language that is common to quite a number of countries in East Africa. Now there, of course, each country has their own dialects, some has many dialects, but this is a, Swahili is a language that gives a kind of unity to many countries in East Africa. And it's a flowing, lilting language, very pleasant to hear, even to the uncomprehending, uncomprehending ear. ear. And, uh, I know, I, I know three or four words in Swahili. Eric knows the whole language, Eric and his family. That's, uh, that's one of their languages. The children even cry in Swahili. I'm kidding. But anyway, uh, I remember just a few words. One of them was jumbo. That's, that's kind of a greeting when you meet somebody in the morning. Another, word, or another couple of words are asante, which means thank you. Asante San, which means thank you very much. And uh, one other word that I learned is the word poli, P O L I. And I remember that word spoken because I saw it also on the road signs. This would be on a road sign, particularly on a curve, where it was curving around, and, and the sign meant to say, drive slowly, slowly around this curve. So, uh, something stuck in my head from that visit, at least. But that particular word, poli, uh, pretty much came to be for me a kind of symbol of the pace of life as we experience it in Tanzania, this uh, large assembly of people from all over the world. All, all of the Tanzanians seem to us so relaxed compared to us foreigners. They moved around in a kind of unhurried fashion. They took their time about doing things. And uh, they didn't really walk hurrying along the street. When they're walking down the street, they're, they're what I would call sauntering rather than walking or walking quickly. And in church, interestingly, people would stand up and move around during the service. And particularly mothers who had children that they were thought were going to cry or something, they would just put them up and, and, and walk around until everything was okay again. It, it, was a, it seemed to be a very relaxed and relaxing style of life. And it was interesting, especially, to notice how differently we Europeans and North Americans function by comparison. When we line up in the passport control or the cafeteria or especially at a bank, we always seem so impatient. We'd be shifted from one foot to another. We would be conspicuously looking at our watches, uh, sighing heavily as though we had terribly important appointments for which we needed to hurry off. But those serving us seemed unconcerned. They wouldn't be rushed, so they simply paid no attention to the, to the obvious impatience with which we were waiting to get things done. And uh, if someone was foolish enough to 
to show that none of those people who were supposed to help us, they would not only not listen, they'd simply turn their back on them and go about doing something at the pace that they wished. But also, interestingly, as the days passed, it was us foreigners who began to change. It was, it was as though we began to appreciate this more informal and unhurried style of life. And it seemed somehow relaxing to participate more fully in the moment, to take some time to talk and laugh with those around us instead of just hurrying off to what we thought we needed to do. Well, I think we all recognize that our Western style is a pretty driven style of life. We prize efficiency. We're highly organized and heavily scheduled. I write things down in a little red appointment book that I have. And I call that book my brains because then I don't have to remember. I can just look it up there to be sure that I don't miss the next appointment. And generally speaking, we like to move things along. We emphasize speed and organization. We motivate and push. We are anxious to get things done with, as we say. And we look for, we look for shortcuts to ways of doing things and ways of getting places. And we calculate our rewards carefully. And we put a premium, a high premium on maximum production in the shortest possible time. Now, I'm talking about two very different cultures. When I talk about that culture that I experienced in Tanzania, and uh, I'm not saying that one culture is necessarily better than another. In fact, there's much to be said in favor of our North American and European style. We have a standard of living that's the envy of the world. And most of us live extremely well for the most part. Almost all of us enjoy a comfortable life that is made so by a dedication to hard work, to energy, to creativity, creativity and to efficiency. If it weren't for those characteristics, we probably wouldn't have the lifestyle we have. But we also know there are some downsides to, to this. People who come from other lands and cultures are often astonished by the consumption, the amount of consumption, and the waste that have become a part of our way of life. And we also have a high incidence of health problems that are directly related to the stresses that are a part of our lifestyle. Now what I've been talking about so far is just a way of leading into our texts for today, especially the text from Romans that has already been read. And the text of Romans I have found especially interesting because we find that these rather startling words. Paul is writing to Roman Christians and he's saying, he begins by saying, let God change the way you think. Now that's not the RSV translation that Vince read. It's the contemporary English version. But I like that version. Let God change the way you think. Now what Paul is talking about here is not a lifestyle. A African or Tanzanian or a Western or European lifestyle. But he's talking about an entire system of values. A way of thinking about life itself. And Paul is saying, don't be so preoccupied with what you can get out of this life. But let God change your way of thinking so you can think about what you do with your life. And the question for us, Paul is saying, is not how well am I doing, but what am I doing that makes my life one that reflects who I am as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is himself an interesting example of a person whose way of thinking was entirely changed. 
And I'd like us to think for just a moment how radically Paul's life was changed by, by a letting God change the way he was thinking about things. Remember who Paul is and who he was. We first meet Paul in the seventh and eighth chapters of the book of Acts. And his name was then Saul. And he was identified as coming from Tarsus. He was a highly educated man, very religious. He was a citizen of two legal regimes. He was a Roman citizen. He was also a Greek citizen. He was a multilingual person. That is, he spoke many languages. He had a very sophisticated education. But his entire life had become taken up with dedication to exterminating the little sect, religious sect, that had grown up around Jesus of Nazareth. And that's where we meet Saul of Tarsus in the book of Acts. He was one of those responsible for listening to the subversive message of Christianity and getting rid of those people. And he pursued that goal with a brutal and murderous determination. And Saul of Tarsus became what today we would call a religious terrorist. That's really what he was. He went around identifying who was Christian and finding ways to get rid of them. But one day he came face to face with Jesus when he was on his way to Damascus in Syria. And suddenly that encounter changed the way he was thinking. From that point on, his life reflected an entirely different understanding of what his life was for. And that's what's reflected in this Romans text that we have heard today. Interestingly, Paul does not suggest we change our occupation. He's not, he's not suggesting that we change what we, what we might happen to be doing. But rather he invites us to let God change the patterns of our thought to reflect the words of Christ. And this means much more than a change of occupation. It's a changing of a way of thinking that's really very, very simple. But it's also something that can be done only by the transformation of our ordinary way of thinking. And that takes a power that is greater than ourselves to do. It takes the power of God. And I'd like you to listen again to these phrases from this ninth chapter of the book of Romans. Or the twelfth chapter of the book of Romans. In the contemporary English version. And here's what Paul says to us. Ask God to bless everyone who mistreats you. Secondly, don't mistreat someone who has mistreated you. Another thing he says is when others are happy, be happy with them. And when they are sad, be sad. In other words, really try to understand the life of other people. Don't just understand your own. And then, and then the next phrase, do your best to live in peace with everyone. The next phrase, make friends with ordinary people. In other words, don't just make friends with with people that you think are important, or people that are happy in some way. Do your best to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, don't try to get even. Let God take revenge. Well, if you take that set of comments that Paul makes in this chapter of Romans, and set them alongside, the way we tend to think in our way of life. 
There's really a very radical contrast, isn't there? Because all of those things are patterns of thought that are the very opposite of our ordinary way of thinking. Our instinctive reaction is against someone who does some damage to us is to strike back to strike back at someone who strikes us, to get even, to take revenge. If there are people we don't like who are having a hard time, we tend to rejoice at their misfortune. And so on. And that's why Paul says, let God change the way you think. So today we have these unusual words, an unusual way of calling attention to how we should live as followers of Jesus Christ. And I think it'd be good for all of us to continue to reflect on what Paul means when he says, let God change things. Amen. We continue our service as we sing the hymn of the day. It's called the summons, and I invite the guardians to stand.
Peace of Christ be with you all. Let's share the peace of Christ. Prove us and try us. Yay. 
Test our hearts and minds as we walk in faithfulness with you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. As the summer breezes away and the forests and foliage begin their colorful journey into fall, make us ever mindful of those earthly blessings and renew our zeal to care for your creation. Lord, in your mercy. Teach us to live peaceably with all nations. Teach us to treat our enemies with love rather than hate. Assess those who have the leadership of nations to be so imbued with the spirit of the gospel that peace rather than war may result. Bring light into the dark corners of the world. Give courage to organizations that seek to overcome evil with good. Lord, in your mercy. When our pain is unceasing, give us patience and suffering. When our wounds refuse to be healed, remember us with your mercy. When hope seems lost, remind us that you are with us always. Lord, in your mercy. As we rally our congregation's time, talents, and resources, remove the stumbling blocks that hinder our desire to put you first. Give us the courage to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow you, Lord, in your mercy. We remember with gratitude those who have recently died. Through the lives of your saints, show us how to hold fast to what is good, Lord, in your mercy. Into your loving hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we have uh, come to the point of announcements of the service forward. And as usual, I really don't have announcements other than those that are printed on the back of the service forward. So I hope you will read them. One, uh, one thing that, announcement that I would make is Pastor Mark and his family will be here again next Sunday because this is my last Sunday in this present term of service. So I just want to take a moment or two to say thank you today for the opportunity of, uh, of uh, coming back here and being your pastor once again for a few months at least. And I'm sorry for the time that I was incapacitated by health problems and couldn't be here every Sunday. But you are a gracious congregation of people. And Andrea and I regard you as part of our extended family, not just a congregation. So it has been our pleasure to be with you and a great pleasure for me to be your pastor again. So I want to thank you for that.
always serve the Lord. Thank you.